So um, first off, I'd like to thank the previous two talks for running early. That means uh, all of my weeks spent practicing this talk to get it at exactly 25 minutes and now wasted, but hey. Um, so I'm David Morgan. I work in uh, Zurich as a software engineer, but actually uh, not on the uh, Dart team. I'll talk a bit more about that later. And uh, first off, a bit of background, actually a, a white background for you all. Um, so I've been writing software for uh, 11 years. Um, and throughout that time, there's been one main motivating force uh, for my work. The one thing that I care about most, and that's been uh, happy developers. This is a picture of a happy developer. Um, and actually, this seems to have worked reasonably well for me. Uh, and I think the reason this has worked well, and actually you've heard the same message in different forms a lot of times today, is that happiness is strongly linked to productivity. Um, and actually, I found a good way to put this. We like building software. We really, really love building good software quickly. So uh, what does this have to do with object models? Uh, first off, by object models, what I mean is I mean uh, the classes that you design, that you write when you're doing object-oriented programming. They don't have to be terribly complicated. Uh, in fact, simple object models are often best. And what I'll be looking at is uh, a simple object model and how happy I feel when I'm implementing it. And for an example, I've chosen a chat application. Uh, it seems to be popular to write these at Google recently. <laughs> but mine is, uh, is not trying to compete with those. It's very, very simple. Uh, users are, are sitting uh, behind a browser. Uh, they have code compiled with Dart to JS, and they're connecting to a single Dart VM, so really a toy application. Now, let's design an object model for this. And particularly, I'm going to talk about uh, classes that I want to send between the server and the client. So first off and most obviously, I'm going to have a class called chat. This is what the client sends in order to say something. Uh, there'll be the, a string field, which is the text, and a set, which is the targets the chat is going to. The server will handle this by sending a show chat to everyone who needs to get the, get the chat. And this will contain the username that the chat came from, a Boolean as to whether it was private, and the text. Let's add a feature. Well, we're going to want to be able to log in. So we'll have a class called login with a username and password. And the server will respond with login response, which is an enum, saying whether or not it succeeded. One more feature just to round out the model. Uh, users will have status. They'll be online, offline, or away. And they'll have a status message they can set. And in order for this to be useful, we have to be able to query this data from the server. So we'll have a class called list users and another list users response. The details are not especially important. This is just an example object model that you could go away and actually write code for. And it would actually do something approximately useful. So let's code this thing. And we'll start with the object model since I defined it. And here it is in Dart. Right? Of course not. Um, but why not? Uh, the reason why not is that raw Dart classes and enums are not especially useful. They actually don't do very much. And there is a whole pile of things that I want my object model to provide that you don't get for free. Let me just quickly go through them. So first and most obviously, I want them to be serializable. Uh, it's going to be kind of hard to write a chat application otherwise. I want them to be classes. I started by saying that I'm doing object-oriented programming. I meant it. I want all these things to be classes that I can have, uh, have them implement interfaces. I can write code. And in Dart, that actually means I can't use enums. It means I'll have to use classes instead. Uh, it also means that I don't want to just write a data specification and have my code generated for me, because then, again, I'm actually not doing object-oriented programming. I want them to be immutable. Uh, you've heard from the Angular team about how um, uh, push updates are better than change detection. Immutability actually works really well with that. There are lots of other good arguments for it. And for me, the way to do immutability in an object-oriented language is the build the pattern. So that's what I want. It also means I'll need immutable collections. I want my object model to have preconditions. 
uh, even in this really simple example, it's obvious that I want null checks on my fields. There's no meaning for my uh, uh, chat instances to have a null text. Finally, I want my object model to be composed of four objects. And by that, I mean that they implement all of the optional parts of object. They are all hashable. They are all comparable. They all have two string. So that, that if I happen to want to compare them or do any of those other things, it just works. So that was my personal laundry list of what I want my object model to do. I'm sure you have your own list. It may be slightly different. But what you have in common with me is that you don't get them for free. So here's my uh, slide. I think some people actually laughed when I sh showed this, because uh, it doesn't do anything useful. Uh, what happens if I actually implement uh, those features that I just described? And I, I do that just for the login class. Watch closely. Ah. Uh, let me zoom that for you. So this is actually the minimum code needed to, to do all of those things that I described. Um, and this is a horrible, horrible violation of the do not repeat yourself principle. Uh, there is no way that your code can be maintainable. There's no way your developers can be happy if you write like this. And someone already used a slide like this, but this is a different snail. Um, <laughs> this is how your developers, um, um, apparently Google image search turned up a different one when I searched for it. Um, this is how your developers are going to feel if, if you make them work like this. So there is an answer, and I appear to have given it away in the, the title of the talk. So source gen for Dart is a really good answer. And you may have detected from, from the way Kevin was talking about it that he actually created this package. So uh, thanks to him. I'm just a user. OK, so now we're going to go into dangerous territory, which is that I'm actually going to demo this. So what does it look like if I'm using source gen? So here I am in, um, in my Dart code. I've put all of these classes in data model.dart. And the whole thing, the whole data model that, that I described, including comments, including code, actually came to about 150 lines. So my, my toy example actually turned out to be a toy example in the code as well, which is kind of what I was hoping for. Let's have a look at that logging class that looks so terrible. Here it is. It's not a whole slide. And the crucial thing here, there's a little bit of weird boilerplate that, I, that I'll explain a bit later. The crucial thing is that the username field and the password field are mentioned just once each. There's no repetition. A couple of uh, general things to note about this object model. I said I wanted immutable collections. I'm using the, let me find one, the built collections, which are very much modeled on the SDK collections, but provide uh, immutability and builders. And I said I wanted to be doing object-oriented programming. Indeed, I have. So there's this interface response, which is for everything that comes back from the server to the client. And I've decided that what I want to be in common of all those things is that they're all renderable, which means, for example, that this login response knows how to display itself on the client. So that's what the code has ended up looking like. Let me just quickly show this thing working to prove that, indeed, this is a a working chat application. So let me connect to it a few times. I'm going to log in. Oops. And I'll set a status message. Oops, can't type. Log in over here too. And I said you could list users. We can list users and get the, I'm a wary, apparently. So this works. And with that, that uh, toy model turned into really a small amount of code. So let's uh, switch back quickly to the slides. How is this working? So I have my data model.dart. The key thing in source gen is something called generators. A generator is something that takes source code as input and produces helper source code as output. And in this example, I have three of them. I have enum class, which helps you write classes that act like enums. I have built value, which provides most of the object model properties that I asked for. And I have built JSON, which provides the serialization. And these three generators are working together to take data model dot as input and provide the helper code, the boilerplate code, 
as data model that g dot dot. Now, there's one thing really critical to know about how this works in practice, which is that this process, this source gen process, is running continuously, which means that as I update the input source, the helper source is immediately updated too. And not just that, it's updated quickly. Absolutely crucial for the developer experience, which I'll demo in a second. Now, there's another thing almost completely unrelated where source gen is also fast, and this is in the runtime. The code that you generate with source gen is arbitrary code. Uh, there's no framework that goes with source gen that you're using at runtime. So the code that is generated with source gen can be as fast as the code that you had written by hand. So this really is generating production quality code. Assuming you wrote production quality generators, which I like to think that I did. <laughs> so let me dive back into the demo. And I want to look at the most interesting of the three generators, which is built value. So first, I mentioned that .g .dot file. You can see it's being used here. This is how the, the generated code is interacting with the code that I write. And the other thing to notice is this weird underscore dollar thing, which you see all over the place. This is just a convention. Uh, this underscore dollar, whenever you see it, that means that uh, this is implemented over in the generated code. It's a hook into generated code. So let's go back to this login class. And let's look a little closer about what's going on here. So first off, this class is, is written as abstract. And the fields that you want are declared as getters. And then the magic is that we have a factory that delegates to an actual implementation provided by the generated code. Here it is. Here's the boilerplate that I didn't want to write that's generated for me. We can see we're doing the null checks. We have a builder. We have a quality hash code to string. That's the builder class. So I claim that this is fast to use uh, as a developer. How fast? Let's see. Pretty fast. So let's just do that a little bit more for effect. List to, and what do we see? We see all of the boilerplate is there. That was almost completely not my work, I should say, having not written source gen. But thanks for the, <laughs> thanks for the applause. So let me reset that to where it was. Um, OK, so what did I have to do to make this work? What is the source gen generator behind this? Let's go to build value generator. So source gen provides uh, this interface generator, which is really as simple as it could be. You have a generate method. What you get past as input is an element from the analyzer. That's your source. You also have build step, which is extra metadata if you need it. I actually don't for any of my generators. And what you return is a string, some source code. The first thing your generator needs to do is determine whether it actually has anything to do. So built value doesn't do anything for libraries or for other top level statements. It only works on classes. So my first check is this element, class element. If not, I return null. And that's how you tell source gen you have nothing to do. If it is a class, we go and do a custom check. Uh, this needs built value check to see if it's something that I'm supposed to generate code for. If not, return null. Once you've determined that you should be doing code generation, your job is to extract the information from that element. And here you have the whole analyzer API. So we're doing things like getting the display name of the class. We're checking if it's abstract or not. We're going through the constructors. We're pulling out the fields. This is all a very nice API. It's core, uh, core .sdk stuff. And once you've extracted the information, you just have to generate the code. So the built value code is actually not very complex. You saw some of the generated code already. So in fact, I just concatenated a bunch of strings. There's really nothing hard here. If you were doing a lot of code generation, you might want to use some sort of template system. Now, the neat thing that source gen does is when you return this source code, it passes it through dot format, which means that the generated code that you see is, is laid out as you expect. The other thing source gen does is it pulls together the output from the different generators that are running and gives them little headers like this one. 
So that was the generator, that was it working on built value. Let me now do a more exciting demo. So what I want to do is to actually add a feature to this chat application. I'm going to do it live on stage. Please bear with me. And the feature that I'm going to add is that when you log in to the, uh, to the server, you can see chats that happened before you connected. And I'm pretty sure the only way to get this correct on stage is with test-driven development. If you like test-driven development, you'll know what I mean. So very first, I'm going to check that my tests are passing. OK. Now, uh, a little aside, a really nice thing if you're running code, uh, both Dart on the server and Dart on the client, is for this kind of test, you can fake out any sort of browser-specific stuff. You can plug the server, server and client code together, and you can run very small, fast tests that actually are behaving like end-to-end -end tests. And that's exactly what I've done here. So I already have a test that Alice and Bob can talk to each other. What I'll do is I'll take that. I'll make it into a test that they can see the log. And what will happen is, instead of connecting at the start, Bob will connect after Alice has spoken. And then he'll only be able to see that if the log was there. And this should now fail. OK, so how am I going to implement this? Well, I'm going to use a new class. And to save a little bit of typing, I'm going to base it on the show chat class. This would be a good time for it not to hang. OK, so I'm going to call it welcome. It's going to hold my welcome message from the server. And we're going to have two fields. One is going to be a list of responses. So these are the, this is the interface. This is not a concrete type. This is the list of any response that the server could have sent previously. And we're going to have a welcome message. And now the one bit of code that I need to write is how or rather, one bit of code that this class needs is how does this thing render? Well, this is pretty obvious. We're going to render it by taking the, oops, bit of a mistake. That should have been public. We're going to uh, render it by taking the log and map it to render each of the responses. We're going to join with new lines. We're going to add a new line. And we're going to add the message. OK, so that's my new uh, class. And as soon as I saved it, it's ready to use. So let's go to the server, implement there. We're going to need this log. And we need to fill it. Oops. So whenever we send a message to everyone, we're also going to add it to the log. Oops. Surprisingly hard to type on stage. OK, and finally, whenever we uh, get a new user, we need to send them this log message. Instead of previously, we were actually sending them a chat, which is a bit rubbish. So here we see the built value builder pattern. And what we notice actually is that the log field here is not just a, a list. What it is is a list builder. And so we have all of the methods that we might want to mutate this list here in line uh, in the builder pattern. So the obvious thing that I'm going to do is add all of my log to it. But if I wanted to, I could also do funky stuff like sort it in line. And actually, I should say that this, this builder pattern is, I think, the nicest way to instantiate stuff in, in Dart or actually any pretty much any object-oriented language. It can be made extremely powerful. And Dart gets a real boost from the cascade operator. Builder plus cascade operator is just uh, an incredibly powerful way to uh, to encode data or initialization in line into your app. So I actually don't want to sort it. Oops. And this text field is now called uh, message. It's called welcome. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Did I call it welcome? Yes. Did I get that wrong in the previous slide? I did. Thank you. I would have caught that with the test, you know. You don't have to tell me. OK, so now with that, uh, with that little bit of help, let's see if it worked. That worked? 
So the feature is actually there, but for those of you don't, who don't believe in test-driven development, we'll actually, uh, we'll actually show it in the browser. So this time, so I'm not cheating, I'm going to close this tab. Let me say, hi there. Let me log in again. And now when I connect, uh, we can see the log has appeared. And I think that deserves a round of applause. Thank you. So it might be surprising that an end-to-end -end feature involving client code, involving server code, involving serialization was actually added so quickly and easily. And the reason it's surprising is because you're not used to having all of the, the boring boilerplate code just appear as you type. And that's really what SourceGen is, is giving me here. So back to the slides. And just to really emphasize that point, this is what I would have written by hand. And this is what I ended up with. And this is clearly a pretty big win. However, that was a toy example. I, you may be wondering, how does this work in the real world? Well, as it happens, I actually work in the real world, uh, unlike, unlike some of my colleagues at Google. And um, <laughs> so my, my team works on something called AdWords for Video, which is part of adwords.google.com. Uh, but you almost certainly know it as this. Uh, this is the skip ad button that appears on some YouTube ads. Uh, we actually didn't do the button. Someone else did that. Uh, but what we do is the, the business-facing part of this, the advertiser-facing part, the website where people buy these ads. So you've heard some numbers about uh, dollar amounts. This is obviously a large, complex, critical business application. Uh, just to give a quick idea of the scale, we have dozens of developers. They're working on hundreds of thousands of lines of Dart across thousands of classes. So certainly a real-world example. And the idea that I've described, um, generating code to support object models, is something that we've actually been doing for a long time, since before we started using Dart. And as with AdSense, uh, we've come from GWT, the Google Web Toolkit, which means we've come from Java. And in the last three years, we've moved to Dart. But what's interesting for this talk is actually the way we moved to Dart. What we did was we, moved, uh, we took our object model with us. So we already had this code generation in Java. We wrote equivalent code generation for Dart. And then we could move bits of our data model piece by piece along with the UI uh, from Java to Dart. And crucially, this meant that we had our JSON serialization for that data model coming with us, which meant that not only could we do RPCs from the Dart code, we could also pass data between the Java JavaScript stack and the Dart JavaScript stack in the browser. So these pieces that we were, that we were deploying uh, could work together. Uh, today, we have most of our browser code in Dart, as I said. And I checked, and we are right now saving 108,000 lines of generated Dart boilerplate, which I think you'll agree uh, we're extremely happy that we're not writing these by hand. So uh, starting to wrap up now, I really, really hope that next time you see a skippable ad on YouTube, you straight away think, uh, object models in Dart with source gen. That would make me really happy. But actually, the real message that I want you to take home is three things. First off, code generation for object models is a really powerful tool for developer happiness and productivity. I've worked on code bases that don't do this. Sadly, it's not actually a very common thing, I think. Um, I've worked on code bases that do. And the difference is that if you're in a code base that is doing this consistently, then all of your object model is consistent. There isn't a case where someone just adds a class and doesn't bother to write the equals method, or adds a class and doesn't bother to write toString. They all behave in the way that you want them to behave. And if you want to add a new feature, you just add it to your code generation. It's a really nice way to work. Secondly, that SourceGen is a really nice way to do this. It's a nice uh, package. It's a nice system. We did this in Java. And in comparison, um, it's easier to write the generators. Uh, that's because the analyzer and Dart format are doing really most of the heavy lifting for you. And it's nicer to use as a developer working on projects that actually use code generation. Thirdly and finally, uh, if you don't want to write your own code generation, there are these quite nice ones that uh, I wrote. Enum class, 
built value and built JSON. You can find them all via this link on GitHub. And you can also find there the chat example. You can play with it yourself and see, in fact, how easy it is to add features to this thing. Uh, that's it. I hope that was interesting and useful. Thank you very much. Wait. David, David, thank you very much. Wait, is it, am I working now? What was running in the background that handled the regen? Aha, I was supposed to show that. It was on my... So the, uh, you didn't see, but there was a little terminal running um, at the bottom, which was running this uh, watcher script, which is just continuously watching and updating the source. Thank you much. Thank you. So we have you. You wait. Uh, actually, I, I want to add on since we're a little bit early, just, just just so people know. So one is obviously source gen is actually a tiny little thing, and like the built. You keep talking about stuff. it, ladies and gentlemen. The author of the source gen package. <laughs> no, it takes a village. No, actually, where's Jake? Jake's probably watching at home right now from Seattle. He's the hero here because he's like, "What are you doing?" And Nate, they're like, "PM, why are you writing this False code?" Modesty. They, I swear, um, it's huge. I'm the most modest person I know. Um, subtle political joke. Uh, but so what I mentioned quickly is, so this is analyzer based, and you notice we're generating on disk, like right next to things. And so you might have asked, why isn't this a transformer, right? People that have done transformers before in Dart. So just a little sneak preview. The nice thing about doing things on disk this way is that you can like control click and go to it. And if the generated code is a big weird, you can debug through it on disk. And so I wanted to kind of plant that in your head as we move into tomorrow and we talk about Basil and some other things. We have a whole story here around how we think about code transformation, templates, code generation, auto code generation, even how DDC is generated. Um, we have a model here around making sure it's super fast, it's incremental, um, it's easy to debug. So keep that all in mind as we kind of step in tomorrow and we talk a little bit about Basil. And the, hopefully the code lab from last night will make more sense.